Hello, true believers. This is Doc Hogg, and welcome to episode 9 of Comics and Variety. Uh, today, I'm going to finish up our examination of the graphic novel um, Shazam, the Monster Society of Evil. And frankly, uh, I'm glad this is it. Um, uh, reading this thing and examining it has been painful, it's been tedious. Uh, comics are supposed to be fun, and this was not fun, and I'm just, I'm happy it's over. Um, before we move on to that, though, uh, I'd like to uh, let you know, uh, give you a little preview of what's coming up uh, next week. Uh, I'm going to uh, be giving you a review of the movie Shazam, which I should be seeing uh, this weekend, and then I'm going to pivot back very briefly to Captain Marvel and to Brie Larson's um, award speech, and you may be saying, oh no, God, not that again, but believe me, this one will be worth it. Um, and then after that, I'm going to start moving on to some Avengers Endgame stuff, so uh do come back next week for all brand new uh, new content. Alrighty, let's move on to all of the plot holes in um, Shazam, uh, A Monster Society of Evil. Well, actually, we're not going to look at all of the plot holes because um, that would <laughs> conceivably take, uh, take a damn long time. And I don't want to uh, uh, belabor this any further than I have to, so... Uh, basically, I'm, I'm really going to limit this to uh, six plot holes, uh, six of the biggest ones that I can find, um, and then, uh, then just um, end it. And like I said before, I'm glad this is all but over. Now, regarding the plot holes in this graphic novel, um, and I'm not just going to look at plot holes here. I'm going to look at uh, also what, what I, I think can be called glaring improbabilities um, you know, things that are improbable even for a, a comic book. But starting off um, early on uh, here, we have, uh, Bill, shortly after Billy Batson gets his powers, uh, he goes back to um, his uh, the, the apartment he's squatting in. This bully thug, uh, Legreen, uh, breaks in trying to steal uh, Billy's money and beat him up, and uh, he runs into Shazam. Shazam scares him off. The guy actually jumps out the window. Okay, fine, uh, that's a nice little way of uh, getting back at Legreen. But here we have, um, you know, Billy Batson now, a couple pages later, uh, he's looking for some money for a hot dog, he, um, you know, goes out of his apartment, oh, and there's Legreen, and Legreen chases him uh, to, the, to the hot dog vendor. Uh, Billy Batson gets uh, gives some money to the hot dog vendor, but you know Legreen shows up and um, uh, Billy Batson takes off. Um, Legreen tries to take the hot dog, and then you know Billy Batson turns into Shazam, and, and then Shazam scares off Legreen again. We've already established a couple pages earlier that Shazam can easily fight off um, Legreen, and um, but. Here we have uh, Billy Batson still running from Legreen. I mean, why not just change into Shazam right away, scare off Legreen, and you know, go enjoy your <laughs> hot dog at uh, at leisure. Um, all righty. Well, moving on here. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, in a couple of scenes here where uh, Shazam and Billy Batson are visiting the Wizard and the Rock of Eternity, and. Um, <clears throat> Billy wants to climb to the top. Shazam warns him, no, that's, that is forbidden. And then we get a couple of scenes here where um, Billy Batson finds out that he's got a sister. Uh, he's clearly traumatized by all of this. This, this whole uh, experience is overwhelming. He runs out of the, uh, the cave that the, the wizard is living in. And you would think that if he's that traumatized, he's not uh, going to be looking for any adventure or going to be doing anything that uh, uh, Shazam uh, warned him against. But oh no, there he is, he's gone to the top of the, uh, of the mountain. Uh, you know, again, that's not, it's not consistent. You don't do daring things, things you weren't told not to do, you know, after you've been, um, you know, almost uh, scared to death. Okay, now, um, yesterday I talked about the plot scenes that involve the, the insects, and um, this is, I guess, kind of a plot hole, and that is that, 
Mr. Mind, uh, one of the villains, is using the, the insects to, uh, he, he's going to use them to kind of run these giant robots, uh, and then use the giant robots to destroy humanity. But here's the thing, it's estimated that there are about 100 million insects for every one human being living on the planet. You know, if Mr. Mind can already control insects, <laughs> he's got a pretty good way of destroying humanity. He doesn't need these giant robots, you know. Um, and, yeah, that does seem maybe a little trivial, a little petty on my part. But when you're going through, re reading through this graphic novel and all these plot holes and improbabilities show up, you know, things like this, you start to think about them. Um, and it's just, it's, it's almost unavoidable that you're going to be uh, thinking that, hey, wait a minute, this, um, if he can control this other means of destroying humanity, why not use it? Why go through all this, uh, all this trouble? So here is what is really the biggest plot hole in this um, in this comic book. Uh, here you have the three monsters. The uh, brown uh, colored one is going to be controlled by Mr. Mine, but the other two uh, monsters are robots. Uh, at the very top, they have a seat, which is called a cockpit, and a human being needs to sit in them for the uh, for the robots basically to be, be able to work, to move. And, uh, the reason is that, is that, uh, it needs the, um, uh, the nervous system of a human being. Now in this panel here, um, Dr. Savannah has kidnapped Mary Marvel, taken her to the top of one of the monsters. Uh, he has made a deal with the main villain, Mr. Mind. Um, he's going to, uh, put Mary Marvel in the cockpit, and presumably he's going to get in the cockpit of the other um, other robot to provide it with the nervous system it needs. Uh, but here, um, Mr. Mind is going back on the deal because on top of the other robot, Billy Batson has gotten to the top of that one, and he's already in the cockpit there. And so uh, Mr. Mind uh, is, is saying, uh, yes, the nervous systems of Earth's insects are not up to my task. Um, you know, that's why they need uh, humans in the cockpit. When we made our deal, you were the, you and the girl were the only humans I had, but now that I have two marvels to drive my companion monsters, all my needs are satisfied. Kindly throw yourself off. Okay, now nothing wrong with that. I mean, other than it seems kind of silly, but later on while Billy Batson is in the cockpit and trapped in the cockpit, he says Shazam, and that turns him into a giant Shazam. Uh, presumably he absorbs the energy and size of the, of the monster. And um, <clears throat> next thing you know, he's fighting the, the other uh, two monsters, including the remaining uh, gray one. Here's the problem. That gray one has no human being in the cockpit. Why? Because uh, Dr. Um, Savannah threw Mary Marvel off the side of the monster. That's why Billy you know, said Shazam so he could, uh, he could save her, which he does. And um, if you see in this panel here, there's Dr. Um, Savannah, uh, very small, but um, there he is, and he's definitely not in the cockpit of that monster, but the monster is moving. It's fighting Shazam. Um, you know, what can you say? Uh, <laughs> this is a book that put uh, politics um, uh, ahead of the plot, um, and, uh, you know, there you go, one major, uh, major plot hole. Alrighty, uh, here's a couple of glaring improbabilities, all right? Remember, Dr. Savannah, according to this book, he was a former senator, lost his re-election. He's now the, the attorney general. And um, he's on top of these monsters. He knows that the military is out here, because he ordered it, ordered it out there. Presumably, from there, he can also see that there's a lot of media uh, recording this stuff. And what does he do with all these eyes on him? He throws a little girl off the side of, of <laughs> off the edge of a monster. And then what does he do later on when, when all these eyes are on him? He pulls out a gun and tries to shoot a little boy. Um, you know, is, is he really that stupid? No, he's supposed to be a genius. He's supposed to be an evil genius. Um, but he's doing things that um, are going to get him in enormous amounts of trouble that are on TV. And, um, you know, you just, you figure a guy that's an evil genius like Dr. Savannah is going to be a tad more media savvy 
uh, at least media savvy enough that he's not going to throw a little girl um, off the edge of a, of a giant monster while he's being recorded by um, you know television cameras. And then I'll just uh, I'll end this because God, I, I really want to end this. So finally, um, <clears throat> looking at the introduction to this book written by Alex Ross. Uh, Ross is um, also a comic book writer. He's written things like uh, The World's Greatest Superheroes, um, Marvels. He's won an Eisner Award. And um, if I were to get a bit, give a bit of advice to, to, to Mr. Ross, when you write an introduction to the book, uh, the introduction should actually say something truthful about the book. <laughs> uh, just right off the bat here, he starts, Charm. That's a quality that few comics deliver these days. Presumably then, this comic delivers on charm. But if it's so charming, is it really such a good idea, you know, f five pages in, to have this scene where Legreen breaks into the uh, apartment that Billy, Bot Billy Batson is squatting in and basically have him kick um, Billy Batson. Um, I, there are a lot of things to, to say about that uh, particular scene. Um, charm is, is definitely not one of them. And, and this book is really in, in no way charming at all. And then you read through this introduction and there's clearly lines where Ross has gotten out the big shovel and laid it on real thick. And I'll just give you one example here. Quote, the gentle care Jeff Smith takes to tell his story is a welcome shock from comics' more standard storytelling approach. Well, it's certainly a shock. It's not welcome, though. Uh, <laughs> it's a shock how bad this thing is. And the reason it's so bad is because uh, Jeff Smith wanted this to be an allegory about the war on terror from the, the left-wing perspective. And um, that came at the expense of, of the plot. You know, a, a typical trope of SJWs in politics. And I'll just end by the fact that this book was published in 2007, um, you know, about 12 years ago. If you look at things like, um, you know, Comics Matter with um, uh, your boy Zach and some of the other comic book channels, they've recently been trying to figure out when this SJW uh, plague in comic books started. Uh, they go back maybe five or six years. Well, this thing, as I noted, is 12 years old, and if we're going to chronicle the, the infestation of SJWs in comics, uh, we're going to have to probably go back at least two decades, maybe, maybe further. All right, uh, glad to be at the end of uh, talking about this graphic novel. Now, uh, let's move on to something else. And now it's time for Hogg's Headlines, all the news that Doc Hogg wants to report on. Dateline, Texas man has no social life. The Guinness Book of World Records has confirmed that Antonio Montero, who lives in Richmond, Texas, has the world's largest collection of video games. He has a record 2,139 games, and he owns more than um, 100 video game consoles that are required to play them all. Quote, I'm really excited to be finally sharing this with the world, end quote, Montero said. Millions and millions of other gamers are no doubt green with envy, but somewhat relieved that most of them, you know, have a girlfriend. Okay, uh, that's all for now. Um, I will be back uh, early next week with my review of the Shazam movie, which I will be going to see on Saturday. Um, as always, please like and subscribe uh, to the uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. And as always, you can contact me at dhog70 at gmail.com and on Twitter at doc underscore hog. Uh, and until uh, next week, have a very nice day.